everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today I have a sex educator, performer, and this might be my favorite title ever, dildo slinger, Dirty Lola on. Hi, Lola. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. I don't, I often have um, mostly performers on, so it's always really exciting for me when I have somebody on who's also an educator, because I feel like all of us have so much to learn about sex, myself included, Mm -hmm. and I know that you are very knowledgeable. I've been doing my research, and um, there's a lot of things that you're very well versed in, so (laughs) could you maybe tell me just a little bit about how you got into becoming an educator? and what your specialties are, if you have any? Yeah, so uh, I started out on Twitter showing my boobs, and that's the truth. So, I mean, that's where we right, all start, right? Where we all start. <laughs> I mean, it seriously was, I was, I don't know, uh, heading towards marriage, very like sad and depressed. I was having a quarter-life crisis, and I, I was monogamous, and I thought the way to fix it was to get a Twitter account and relive my glory days. So I would do micro erotica online. So that kind of moved into a blog. And then I've always been that friend that knows sex things. I've been very, since I was a kid, like any book, I read the joy of sex because it was on one of my friend's mom's like bookshelf. Like I would eat anything up about sex. I was really interested in everything. So I've always been that friend that could answer your random ass questions about sex And Twitter became this place to like have conversations with people and talk about sex. And like people, people just assume if you have a blog or you do something, you know, something, which I'm always like intrigued by. And, but I would just happen to have answers for things. And at the same time, I was also hosting burlesque shows um, with a friend. And she was like, you know, you need to put these two things together. Like you're always like every party we sit around and talk about sex and you always have answers you always know all this information you know stuff that I never thought about and other people need this and I was like nobody's gonna want to listen to me talk about sex on stage like who's gonna pay to do that and then I started going to uh, sex positivity conferences and I was like really wanting to be more a part of the community and it was like well how do I do this all I have is this blog and I didn't really know how I fit in and then I was like oh what if I did put these things together and I made a show and that's where sex at a go-go was born. And mostly that was because I wanted to be a fun source of information for people. And I also wanted to like introduce folks to all these amazing sex educators I was meeting that nobody ever knew. Like I remember being so enamored when I met Ducky Doolittle and then so excited to talk about her and her work And so many people were like, who, who's that? I don't know who that is. And I'm like, how do you not know who Ducky is? So this became like a way to showcase people, my colleagues, friends, um, people within sexuality that most muggles don't ever hear about or don't, and don't know who they are. And that's how I got started. And then the show turned into speaking and teaching. And I started working in a sex shop and, that somehow I ended up here. <laughs> and, and you had a uh, pretty conservative upbringing, right? Somewhat. Yeah. Like we, I'm, my mom was super religious and we went to church a whole lot. Uh, like we went to one of those churches where you couldn't wear pants if you were a girl. So I spent like a good portion of my youth, not celebrating Christmas and not being able to wear pants. Um, my family didn't talk about sex, but again, curious child uh and hbo in cinemax in the in the 80s and 90s was very informative late night when no one was awake so i did a lot of like poking around so nobody talked about sex in my house i don't think i ever got the talk i always make the joke that uh, i got the talk from hbo um back in the day but yeah like it, it was conservative in the way that we it sex was just not a subject it was just not It wasn't like, and and the only thing my mom ever said around sex is don't come home with a baby. That was the only, not, I'm not going to tell you how to not come home with a baby, but just don't do it. (laughs) So how did you educate yourself from a young age? I mean, I know you just said HBO and Cinemax, but obviously there's only so much that media is going to tell you. Right. I mean, 
weird enough in South Carolina in my around that time I had fourth and fifth grade they actually did give us some sex ed it was all you know all around procreation and how your body works and how babies are made but we did get that and I think it was we were like that first wave maybe they were experimenting because I remember them sending home this really long like three page release for parents to give permission and it was such a thing and there were kids who got pulled out during that week of learning and they separated us and it was like girls had to go in one spot and boys had to go in another and so that was where I learned like you know your basic stuff like how your body works and things like that and then I would just go to the library and look for things because I wanted to know more about stuff I also found my grandpa's stash of porn um Mm. (laughs) around that time and porn can be very informative like porn magazines especially like those little booklets with stories that was like captivating because people were talking about things they were interested in sex acts like stuff they were fantasizing about and my little brain was just like this is amazing oh my goodness I I want to know more God, it's so funny because you think about how kind of innocent discovering porn was, you know, back in our day, because I think you and I are probably around the same age. Um, And then, you know, my mom made porn. So obviously, like, I found that. But, you know, she shot for all the magazines, like Penthouse Magazine and High Society and all that kind of stuff. So my education in terms of porn was really just like magazine layouts, which was pretty tame, Yeah. to be fair. I remember... One of the first ones that I saw was a penthouse layout and the story alongside it was like basically these two women kind of sort of quasi kidnap this guy and then seduce him and like tie him up. And then there was this whole part about this one girl like laying soft farts in his face. And I just remember being like, that is a thing. Is that it. like farting in someone's face? Is that a sexual thing? Be, be yeah. a little confused by that. And I have to say, I still uh, don't find that to be sexy. But hey, you know, I'm not here to kink shame or to anything like that. Own. But yeah, to each their own. But it's so crazy that now, you know, kids are educated by going online and looking at tube sites and seeing these crazy extreme acts. Yeah. You know, yeah. back when my mom was shooting when I was young, they couldn't even show penetration in the magazines. They could it was barely all like, show, like it was raunchy if they did like a full open spread leg and spread lips. Like that yeah. was not a thing that you saw. Yeah. Yeah. It was more of looking yeah. at the female form, the male form. Yeah. It wasn't. When I yeah. say that, people go, oh my God. I'm like, it wasn't that serious. No, it really wasn't. And, and it, and the thing is, is that, you know, it's like on one hand, you know, I don't think it's good that, you know, 11 year olds can go and, and, and watch, you know, triple anal scenes because without any education behind that, because they don't understand right. what they're seeing. But right. on the other hand, there is so much more education and resources online and so much different kinds of porn. Like you can find yeah. beautiful, cinematic, sex positive, queer positive porn if you know where to look for it. So exactly. Yeah. I don't know. How do you feel about how do you feel about that? Like the early access to free porn? Because people ask me this question all the time and yeah. I wish I had like a great answer where I was like, This is what we should do and right. I really don't have one. It's it's I I agree. I think I don't I wish kids weren't finding that stuff because there's no one giving them instruction around it or an- there to answer mm-hmm. questions or there to say this is fantasy like porn is fantasy it's yes it's real people and yes it's real people having real sex and it's not really scripted but in a way it is scripted and there's a lot of things that happen in porn in the background that even adults don't realize which is why we keep having to explain to adults that it's fantasy and that not everybody's body looks like that or works like that um and there's you know editing (laughs) there's things that nobody's having sex for three hours without having an orgasm for the most part it's there's a lot yeah. of things edited together and we don't have that in life. I wish there was, I feel like one of it, uh, one of the things I feel is a lot of parents aren't being, 
they don't want to do the due dil- diligence. They just don't want it to exist because there are ways mm-hmm. to keep your kids from looking at things and watching things and have conversations with them. So it's like, hey, like if you're at a friend's house, I'm not OK with you looking at this stuff. This is why I'm not OK with you. But nobody wants to even talk about it. Like have a conversation that porn exists. I'm blocking these things on your computer and your phone because I don't want you to accidentally find them because it's one one day it'll be okay for you to look at it. But right now, this is not something you need to see. And then one of my friends said, she told her kids, when you're ready to have a conversation with me about sex, then that's when you'll be ready to actually watch porn. But like have a real conversation with your mom about sex. And her kid was like, that's never going to happen. And she's like, well, you're never going to watch porn. And it was funny, but it was true. <laughs> she's like, if you're not mature enough to sit at a table and come to me with questions about how your body works and sex and all these things, you shouldn't be watching it on your own yet without knowing anything else about sex and people's bodies and consent and how things work. Because a lot of porn doesn't model consent, you know, because again, it's fantasy and there's all these mixed messages that kids get from it when they think, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. So right. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying before about how when you did have sex education at school, how parents had to sign this long ass release. Yeah. And then like some kids got pulled out of that because some parents really don't want to teach their kids Mm-mm. about sex because they think that like sex education equals like sexual promiscuity, right. which is not the case at all. I think That's if anything, like the statistics are opposite. Yeah, it is. Well, and I think one of the things that we gloss over is that sex ed is just, it's more about the more, it's about more than just sex. It's about consent. It's about, it is about how your body works, but it's about all your body, not just your procreation parts. It's about your pleasure parts. And the fact that we don't teach, especially, you know, um, AFAB individuals, we don't talk to them about their pleasure centers and how to masturbate and how to gain pleasure. We talk to boys about that a bit. We talk to them about like, oh, you might be experiencing, you know, arousal and this is what this means. And and we give them something and they still have their own, you know, cross bear when it comes to like the shame around touching yourself and things. But we don't talk about any of that about and pleasure that you can get from yourself. I, for one, believe that if we talk to kids more about this is how where babies come from. We know your bodies are overwhelming you right now with hormones. But hey, here's how you can take care of that without getting yourself into some trouble that you might not be ready to get you you know to be getting into. Imagine like I had been I've been masturbating since I was wee, like five or six. So I think that's why I waited so long to have sex because I was like, mm, okay, this is cool. Like I don't want a baby. Um, I like making out, but also I know how to make myself come from doing these things. And I've had orgasms. I'm cool. I, I don't need a boy to make me have an orgasm. And then I was so disappointed the first time I had sex. Cause I was like, oh, okay, well, that was cool. 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 <laughs> Cause I had already given myself, I knew what, what was supposed to be waiting for me and it wasn't. And so it was just like, oh. Okay. Well, God, you are so, you are so right. Because even when we do have sex education, we just pretty much talk about the mechanics of it and mm-hmm. how to avoid pregnancy. Right. Yeah. And like the body parts and what you're doing, but we don't ever talk about pleasure. Yeah. And I started masturbating from not as young as you, but I started masturbating from a pretty young age, maybe like, I don't know, maybe 10 ish or something mm-hmm. like that. So, um, so I also didn't lose my virginity particularly late. I lost it at 16, which I mean, honestly, in these days, standards, I feel like isn't that bad, but, no. and you're right. My experience, my losing virginity experience was such a letdown. Um, but can you imagine a world and God, there's going to be so much like if one was to truly suggest this, so you would have so much pushback against it, but the idea of teaching a child about sexual pleasure rather than letting them experience it on their own because they will yeah eventually right and and we make it such a taboo thing and so secretive 
and um, and there's so much shame built around it. I remember I had a therapist once, and we just were talking kind of conversationally about um, sexuality, and she was talking about her her daughter who was very very young, you know, and how she would keep like touching herself because once kids discover their genitals, they're like, this is kind of an amazing thing. And that it's not sexualized, you know what I'm right. saying? So there's no like shame around it. No. Um, they're just like, this feels good. And it's just a physical reaction. And then we like, you know, we kind of push them down and say mm -hmm. like, you can't do that. And she was talking about how she was struggling about not shaming her daughter about like touching herself, but instructing her daughter that it wasn't appropriate to do in public. Right. Um, around yeah. guests, which, which is true, but it she was just talking about that struggle that she was having with having that conversation about not building shame, but also trying to explain that this is something that isn't appropriate to do in front of other people. And yeah, it's kind of a tricky subject, but it is, I, I have feel friends like it's something who are, worth considering. Yeah. I have friends who are modeling that. I mean, they have kids and they talk about it online. And one of the best things I've seen with with this uh, one friend she has a little girl and she's found herself and so and she likes to be naked so she has these conversations of like oh would you like some alone time because she'll say mom this i like she's like you know you're not supposed to be touching yourself right now when we're in the living room she's like but it feels good she's like i know it does but that's a bedroom thing so would you like some private time right. and she gives her like the like she'll say oh yes i would and she'll leave and i think that's the thing is being okay with knowing your kids are doing what's natural what feels good and that you're not going to mm -hmm. barge in I mean I don't I don't know about you but like I, I remember getting caught masturbated I got in a lot of trouble didn't stop me I just got better at doing mm -hmm. it when nobody was around or <laughs> being quieter and, um, with it but I got in trouble when I got caught like it wasn't okay for me to be masturbating and so how many kids over the years are being taught, like, it's bad to pleasure yourself. You shouldn't be doing this. I mean, we know that there's a whole, especially within Christianity, about, like, it being the devil and, you know, evil for you yeah. to be masturbating and all those Don't things. they have those, like, anti-masturbation crosses or something like that where you, like, like Velcro no. your kid to a cross? The whole thing. Which, to me, I is mean, like, you're just making kinky what children. What the fuck? You're just making kinky children. You're just getting, you're making it worse for yourself. <laughs> but why can't we have those conversations? Like that is even starting with like talking to your kids about their actual names of their body parts and not giving them cute nicknames, right. which that has been mm -hmm. proven helps when you talk to your kids about their body parts and who's supposed to be allowed to touch them and who's not. And like, what's okay touch and what's not okay touch and all these things you help stop like child molestation and things of that nature because the kids will recognize this is not okay they're not going to be confused about people trying to do things to them because it's an adult and we tend to tell kids that like adult you're supposed to listen to adults and all these things but when you give them this information you create a child who's able to say uh -uh, this is not correct so that's part of sex education as well like all these things people want to stop trafficking and they want you know all this stuff that people they say they care about sex ed is at the root of those problems and fixing it's like teaching people giving them body autonomy teaching them about their bodies giving them um you know control of their own pleasure giving people ways to seek things out in a way that's not dangerous and is not putting themselves at risk all of these things are part of sex ed and how many problems could be lessened if we started doing that with kids at a young age and being honest with them and not you know, making up stories like the stork brings the baby or, right. you know, like all the things that parents tell their kids and, and also realizing kids are smart as fuck. I, I speak at high school sometimes and I've sp spoken at a, in a middle school at a, in a science class. And I always let the kids give me the answers. I don't come in with the workshop. I, I come in to answer questions. They put them in a jar or in hat. The things that these children are asking me, people would die. They would blush. They would go, oh, my God. But it's stuff they know. Like, I was in a high school class, and somebody was like, hey, do you really come if somebody touches you with their feet? So we had a whole conversation about fetish and, like, why this might work for some people. And they were like, 
they knew just enough to ask the questions, but they were blown away. Like, oh my God, I didn't realize this was a thing. Oh, I saw this stuff. And it was like, yeah, because you're getting part of the story. You know, you're not getting all the information. You're seeing things and you're not. And now you know stuff. So now you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, I think, I think we do have to reconsider sex ed in the light of the fact that we live in a world now with technology that delivers, you know, porn and so much information about sex yeah. without the sex ed part to kids. You know, I understand right. the idea of wanting to preserve the innocence of children and, you know, I'm going to be a mom and I certainly like don't, you know, and I work in porn and I don't want my kid watching porn at a young yeah. age and I don't want her, um, you know, these are all uncomfortable conversations, but I think, you know, now that we really need to think about, okay, well, we're in this new world now, these kids are going to find this out anyways, what, how can we teach them about sexuality in a responsible way that's not too much for the age mm -hmm. that they're at? I, I, you know, it's interesting that you brought up that whole thing about how teaching kids the correct names for their genitalia was really important and also helped kind of prevent, helped educate them, which helped prevent like sexual molestation because then kids kind of understood more about like what was appropriate to be touched by an adult, et cetera, et cetera. And I heard there's a, there, there was a show about parenting that I heard them talking about on NPR that was specifically like pretty much exactly that. Yeah. And they were talking about different stages of, you know, your child's um, life that you bring certain things up in. So it was kind of like, okay, right. at this age, talk about this. At this age, talk about this. It's not like you're going to sit down a five-year-old and like tell them about foot fetish. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like it's, it's yeah. you know, like appropriate times to talk about appropriate right. things. And it's such like a tricky subject and I get it. Like nobody wants to talk about sex and children and nobody wants to think about porn and children. And, but it's like, Sex education mm -hmm. and children, I think, is a different story. So it's giving them the it's it's not even giving them the knowledge. It's admitting, right? Because it's already out there. It's don't yeah. get caught in a lie, right? Like porn exists. Right. Here's how people use porn. This is why I don't think it's good for you. And I think that's a thing that people have to sit and think about for themselves. That a lot of adults, we all grew up with the because I said so. And that was good mm -hmm. enough for us. Yeah, well, Google exists now, right? So before, what did I have? Encyclopedia Britannica. And that didn't have anything about porn in it. So, you know, I couldn't go look things up in the same way. But now if you say, because I said so, they can get online. And even if they're not looking at porn directly, they can go look up. There's a breadth of knowledge on the internet that you should be part of that experience and the guidance of it and helping them you know or keeping them from things like you said things should be doled out in pieces like there's like um i've seen like the chart where it's like from this age to this age here's the stuff you should teach them and a lot of it it's like you get a big chunk of time before you have to move into the next line of conversation mm -hmm. with but it's it is telling them about body parts talking to them about consent who who, why somebody would touch you and who gets to do that? Like the doctor and mom and dad when you're bathing and here's what good touch is and here's what like bad touch is. And like, this is right. touch you should say no. And then if something happens, you should talk to your mom or dad or an adult that you trust. Um, and, and that you won't get in trouble. Like explaining all of these things to kids is protecting them. And people feel like if we keep kids in ignorant bliss, it's like, yes, they are ignorant. And that is what people who are predators prey on. They prey on innocence. They prey on ignorance. They prey on that you've not shaped them beyond adults or helpers. Um, I was having this conversation with somebody the other day is like, I feel like we there's not the same fever around stranger danger and keeping kids safe. Like, I feel like I grew up with this set of rules of knowing what to look out for and who not to talk to. And none of my clothes had my name on them. And that like, was like a real thing that they would talk about not doing. And now like, I just yelled at a family member for wanting to put my niece and nephew's name on their face mask. And I was like, why would you do that? Do you want them to get kidnapped? Like, what is wrong with you? 
do you not remember that this is literally a thing that people do like to get to know children and to groom them and things like get it together but then you don't want me to talk to them about sex ed things that could protect them because somehow that's a bad thing and it's not it's it's giving them tools and it's giving you tools too because if you start talking to your kid when they're three four five about their bodies it's going to be so easy for you to keep Mm -hmm. going so when you have a five-year-old then when you have a 10 12 year old and you have to talk about periods or you have to talk about nocturnal emissions or, or like all these things that start happening they're not going to feel like they can't talk to you because you've been having body conversations as long as they can remember it's not going to feel awkward and gross to say oh my god I'm having my period or here's something that's going on with my body this is a the way I'm feeling doesn't you know all of these things imagine that gift to be able to do that without an issue but it has to start early you're not going to get that magic like if you wait till they're 13 14 you're fucked that's <laughs> Well, yeah, because the, cause they're in that stage already where they already think their parents aren't cool anymore. Right, and right. you're having that separation like due to adolescence. So, And also, too, I, yeah, I think this whole ostrich and head in the sand practice doesn't work. Right. And, a- again, it, by, by the silence and kind of ignoring it, you know, y- you create this secrecy around sex, which mm-hmm. breeds a sense of shame, which breeds confusion, And none of these things are healthy. None. So. Nothing. All right. We're going to take a quick break and we will be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, so we're back. So Lola, kind of to spin off from this whole discussion that we were talking about, you know, discovering your sexuality as a kid, I know that you are into BDSM um, Mm -hmm. as a submissive, and I have had experience in that area as well. And I actually remember the very first time I experienced any kind of excitement around that was when I was a kid. And I think I was playing like cops and robbers with my neighbor kids, and I got caught and they Ooh. tied me up. I was probably like 12 or something like that. And they tied me up and put me in jail. And there was something about getting tied up bound, which really excited me, which surprised me. And then I remember like they quickly lost interest in the game and then like untied me. And I was like, no, no, tie me back up. I've, <laughs> I will escape and murder your family. Don't let me go. <laughs> so that was like my first kind of inkling that I might be into something a little bit different right uh so tell me a little bit about your experience with BDSM I so I didn't know that early I think my first like twinkles of I might be kinky came from reading erotica and like anytime Mm. there was like a submissive moment like somebody and it might not even be an actual BDSM like erotic or anything it would just be this 
situation of somebody being dominant and kind of controlling, but in like, because I care about you way. And that really, I was like, oh, I like that. And nobody tells you like, oh, this is kinky or you're, this is what you're into. Um, But it always appealed to me. And then as I got older, I realized like everything I'm reading is skewed a certain way. And this is the stuff that really turns me on. And when I found Twitter, that was when I was just like, this is like amazing. It was like somebody opened Pandora's box and all of this amazing stuff just flew out all of this stuff just came out at me where I started finding people's blogs about kink because the early 2000s mid to mid 2000s were really heavy with people being online and talking about like their experiences everybody had a blog everybody was doing a thing so that was great because I was getting to read people's like firsthand accounts of what they were into and like I would read about rope and rope has never rope is I've always been curious about it but I'm too fidgety and I can't bliss out when I'm tied up because I'm just like what's happening next what's going on so you know I that (laughs) never was my thing but just having someone like make me submit or somebody having that kind of power that makes me want to submit and then I started realizing like oh I do this anyway there are people that give off like dominant energy who I will list I'm a brat like all through life Everybody thinks I'm a top because I'm bossy. I know what I want. I like run my own shit. I'm also like, just let me do it because I know how to do it right. Like that's me, but I don't want to always have to do things. And it's rare to find somebody who I feel comfortable enough that I feel like, oh, you're going to take care of it. And I don't have to, my brain can shut off. So when I'm around those people, I'm like, oh, this is what this is. And so those that was when I really started like, this is something. How do I do this? Because now I'm married. My husband at the time wanted nothing to do with it. And I'm just like, okay, am I going to be a sad, like not fulfilling any of my things in my life? I'm not even 30 yet. And I'm already sad and like, oh, I'm never going to get to have this kind of sex that I want to have. And then I met a dom online. And that was where like that journey began with like, how do you, how do you, how, I was like, I don't even know. What does this mean? Like, how would I be a submissive? What is this? What does being a submissive mean? And he like took me on and actually we told my husband about it. And I was like, Hey, you don't want to do this, but I'm real interested in this. And like, I need, I need to do this. So we weren't open or anything. And it was all strictly between phone, computer, text, all of that. But he really kind of took me on and was like, I'm going to teach you about submission. And he did. And I've been ever grateful because I also learned like, yep, this is not the kind, this is, I don't want to be 24 seven submissive ever again, but these are the, this is definitely my area that makes me go, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever try, um, did you ever get your husband to like try to be dominant with you? And then it just like did, yeah, I did that too with my ex and, and, you know, he knew I was into that and he would try, but he just, he just had, you have, like, I think for, for women like you and me who are like strong women who tend to be like bossy in real life, who run our own shit. And for Mm -hmm. us, that sex, that, that submission is like a sexual release where we get to turn off. I mean, you have to be with somebody who like, puts you there and they know what they're doing. And yeah, I remember with my ex, I think once he like called, cause he was English, he called me like a bloody wench. And I was like, what is this? Like the 1600s? You know what I mean? It just told, I was like this, just stop. Just forget it. Cut. Never mind. This isn't working. Yeah. Well, and that's the, I think also it's when people talk about dominance and submission, it's also with dominance, it's how you conduct yourself. So for me, with mm-hmm. my ex, I kind of ran the household. Like I planned everything. If we went any, like he just sat back. He didn't want to do that stuff. So if we were going to see friends, if it was somebody's birthday, like I knew, oh, we have to buy this gift. We're going to so and so's house. It's Passover. We got to do this thing. Um, we need to go to the grocery store. Here's the grocery list. Here's the meals we're making this week. I have this. You have that. You've got to make a doctor's. Okay. Like that was me. And he did not take any of that on. 
And if you're somebody who's kind of sitting back, I, I had a, we were out with a friend and she looked at him and she, and she looked at me and then she looked at him and she looked back at me and she goes, he's a submissive. And he got so upset, but I still, I believe he is too, because he is very like sits back, wants to be told what to do, does not really want to think for himself as far as like, he's not a forward thinker. So he's like, T- just tell me, give me a list, give me a to-do list and I'll do what's on it. And he wants you to, and he needs to be reminded. And there's all these things. And she's like, you're a submissive. Like, she's like, you might not, it might not. Yeah, turn but he, on, but this is your yeah, personality. He didn't, I, I was going to say, men almost never like being called that. No, because you know our us and our rigid gender roles like you right. have to be like a man and be dominant all the time regardless of your actual personality right but dominance is control and if you're not controlling things and you're sitting back and letting other people run stuff and that was what i tried to explain to him is like she's not saying like you're a pussy she's saying you don't take charge you follow you follow someone else's lead that is a thing that you like to do that's how you like to operate that is submissive type behavior. So how could I expect you to be able to take charge and take control in the bedroom in the way that I need you to when you don't really want to do that in our life? And so I got it. And that was why I stopped trying to pursue it with him because I tried to give him, I gave him books and I gave him some blog. I found a blog way back in the day. It was like the apprehensive Dom or something like that. And I the gave him- The apprehensive Dom. And it was a husband whose wife had said, like, oh, I'm submissive. And it was, like, him writing about, like, his journey through through it. And I was like, you might find this interesting. And he just did not care to touch it or read it. He also couldn't wrap his head around, like, oh, you like pain and you want somebody to hit you or do you want to bleed? I'm like, ah, eh, I could do without the bleeding. If it happens, it happens. But, yeah. But also, like, don't just haul off and hit me because I'll punch you back because I'm not in the right mm-hmm. headspace to receive yeah. pain. Yeah. So it was hard. And I stopped because I was like, I need to be on this journey for myself. And I don't need to be on this journey trying to also teach you when I'm trying to learn myself. I can't be giving you lessons. <laughs> yeah. Right. So can you talk, um, cause I heard you mention on another podcast, you talked about how BDSM actually helped you with some past sexual trauma. Yeah. So could you explain how that worked for you? Yeah. So part of my um, sexual trauma was separating from my body, which a lot of survivors do. I was really little as well. So that was just a thing I did to move away from it. And that's a thing that still, if it's not good sex, I have to make sure I'm paying attention because I will float away and I won't be in my body and I stop feeling things. And for years I had no feeling in my nipples. It was just like, they were there. If somebody touched them, it was like, all right, you're touching them. Cool. Hope you're having fun. Like it just didn't feel good. And when I met my first dom, like we were just kind of going over all the things. He's just like, what do you like? What do you don't like your nipples? And I was like, this is why I don't like it. He goes, you don't feel anything. He's like, it's okay. We'll take care of that. And he started having me band my nipples with rubber bands and leave them on for a little bit. And he would time it. And I had like a whole thing and I had to send him pictures. And then he would tell me when to take them off. When you are, creating sensation like that your brain cannot keep turning off your receptors so because that's all your but your brain is doing your brain is providing a block because this was a thing that used to cause you pain and displeasure and something that wasn't good for you so your brain's like i'll fix it i'll take care of it let me turn it off when you're doing something like that it turns everything back on so my brain was like oh wow i can't like there are those nipples like i couldn't ignore it anymore And with the pain started coming the pleasure and the having sensitivity and like when people touch them, write them and things, it started to feel good again because it was, my brain was starting to learn that they were there again. So it kind of forced that block to be lifted. Um, And that was like really, really valuable. And also kink helped me with meditating and staying in my body because like when I'm having any kind of pain scene you have to really like breathe and be there and listen to the room and listen to your breathing and listen to your dom and you're waiting for instruction you can't float away because if you float away and you don't answer you're gonna get in trouble or if you don't count your you know all of those things so it helped me stay instead of escape 
and that stuff flowed into like having sex and being able to like stay in my body and I learned what I needed like I love when people talk to me during sex and it's because it helps me stay porn porn really was a great thing because being able to watch porn during sex meant my brain was occupied too occupied to put that block up it's also something pleasurable on the screen so it's mimicking what's happening to me so all of that kind of helped me learn get over this latent trauma because I didn't really start having um trauma effects until my 20s I went through most of my young and teen life not having side effects from like PTSD and moments and it didn't happen until I got into my early to mid 20s that the floodgates opened and like I realized so much was going on and it was like well how do we fix this now like what do we do I have no idea because and also it's like somebody's it's like go to therapy I'm like what am I gonna do in therapy about getting my nipples back online and not floating away and I'm sure I could have but all but kink was cheaper and more fun Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's something very, there is something therapeutic about kink. I've had a lot of people come on the show and talk about it. And also I think that kink is a great exercise if you're doing it with the right people Mm -hmm. in setting boundaries and talking about consent because so many people in vanilla relationships don't talk about sex and don't talk about boundaries and don't talk about consent because Mm -hmm you're not doing anything that one feels is extreme enough that, you know, you need a safe word or something like that. And I remember when I first started dating the guy who was a dom, he gave me a consent list, like a checklist of like things that I was okay with and things that I wasn't okay with. And I was like, what is, what is this nonsense? And he was like, I want to know what you're comfortable with. I want to know what you want to try. I want to know what you definitely don't want to try. And it was like, I was like, is this like homework that I have to go do it was just so weird to me but it was it was actually like a a really good thing and and he was so much more communicative than so many of my other sexual partners yeah um I know that you talked about some really interesting things uh about um one thing that you mentioned about going to a dungeon was a dungeon monitor which I'd actually not heard of so I've never like done any kind of play in a dungeon or anything like that it was always just at home and I've kind of I don't want to say I've grown out of it but um I don't really engage in a lot of of that anymore I've become quite dull in my old age uh (laughs) but um maybe talk a little bit about that and about um playing in a dungeon because that was something that I actually wasn't aware of yeah so Usually at, especially like events, um, because I've done a lot more kink events than like actual dungeon, which there's some in New York, but there's usually somebody who is just making sure everything's going okay, that people, scenes are going well, that if somebody's using like a whip on the, with the St. Andrew's cross, that there's not people too close to them. They're kind of making sure people are spaced out and things are going on and like that there's nobody in distress Um, And at events, they're great because there's usually a dungeon set up at a kink event and there'll be people who have like their, their kits out. So for various things and the DMs are there to one, make sure that those people know what they're doing. So like the first time I tried needles, I was at a kink conference and the guy had his whole kit set out and I was the only one wandering around the dungeon at the time. And he was like, Hey, would you love this? And I was like, I would. But, and as soon as I said, but the DM came up and was like, oh, are you thinking about trying this out? I was like, yes. They're like, oh, well, let us look through his kit. So they made sure just that he had everything he needed for safety, that everything was pre-wrapped and sterile and all the stuff. And they went through it and they're like, okay. And they asked him some questions. So there was somebody there who knew about this stuff to vet that person, because I wouldn't have known what to look for at all before somebody you know did because I had never done needles before so it made me feel safer to like Mm. watch this happen and then I was able to relax and experience something new it was wonderful and actually because again in a kink setting because somebody was like you let somebody put needles in your back you didn't know and I was like yeah but we had a whole conversation where I was able to say like hey watch my eyes if my pupils blow that means you need to stop because I'm not going to tell you to stop because that means I'm too far gone Like I get high, like it looks like I've done drugs. It's going to look like I did ecstasy. You're not going to see my brown anymore. It's just going to be black. And he was like, 
oh. And I'm like, you know, it's cool. It just means I'm too high. I'm way high. And I'll tell you everything feels good. <laughs> and so you won't get a good gauge with me anymore. I won't be able to be truthful with you because I won't really be feeling anything. And he was like, that was the best way anybody's described that to me. And I'm like, yeah, I've learned these things about myself, but we had that conversation and you're right. Vanilla sex. You'd never have that kind of conversation about like, Hey, if you're doing something to me and my pupils blow and you ask me questions, I can't give you real consent. I have that conversation with people all the time where I'm like, don't, I can't, I'm not, we can't plan anything if we're doing this because I can't give you new consent for things once I'm Mm. in that state. Cause I'm too, it's too euphoric. Yeah. And also too, I think that, that, that pre session conversation is really great because once you start to get into the sex and you're like transported into a different mindset, it's awkward to be like, you know what? Uh, please don't do that. You know, like mm-hmm. it takes you out of that moment. You know, we want to stay in that moment. So, so having those discussions before you start, before you get into that headspace, yeah. you know, sets these, these clear, this clear protocol, yeah. which everybody can follow. And then you don't ever have to like pull yourself out of that, that moment and be like, yeah, don't do that. It's like, right. it's all set up beforehand. And that's or give you a that's, word to yeah. moan. Like I do colors cause it's just easier. Also, I like having right a medium. So I love the word. Mm-hmm. I love yellow because yellow doesn't mean stop. It means slow down. Like and slow adjust. down. Yeah. Or just depending on what we're doing. And I will be like, yellow, right. like, it's like, I'm liking it, but I need you to, you know, adjust the thing. And that works great. Cause it's not stopping the action. And even if it's just fucking like, I might just be in a position that's so much right now. And if I moan yellow, it mm-hmm. means take me out of it. Put yeah. Me in a new position. Yeah. Yeah. I I also want to ask you about everybody's favorite topic, uh, mm-hmm. anal sex, because I know that you mentioned that as a sex educator, one of the questions you get asked a lot is about anal sex and mm-hmm. something a lot of cu- people are curious about, but are nervous to engage in. And you actually outlined three steps to anal sex. So yes. can you tell us about that? Yes. So everybody thinks when people come in to buy stuff, it's either they're looking for some, sometimes people are looking for a toy because they realize that maybe a dick isn't the first thing you should put in your ass. Um, so this is when you're working at a sex shop, sex right? Shop, right. Um, or they're looking for something to numb it or they don't want to feel it at all. And then that's a whole other conversation about like why you need to feel it. And this could hurt you in many ways. You're not feeling what's going on. Um, but I always tell people there's three steps. Step one, is have you put fingers in your butt before? And if the answer is no, I go get them a pack of gloves and and some lube. And I'm like, this is where you start. Don't even buy a toy yet. You don't even know if you'd like to have something in your butt and you're about to buy something that costs $85 um, that you're going to try to put in your butt and then you're going to hate it because you've never put anything in your butt before. And you're going to be mad at me for the rest of your life for selling you this $85 toy. So I always, step one is experiment with your fingers gloves are great not just because of mess like yes that's part of it if people are scared of poop and things like that but it's like why scuba divers go in the water wearing scuba suits it's to make your body more slick as you slide through the water same thing with your hands like even if your nails are well manicured like if you have a hang nail if your cuticles are rough you feel all of that nobody wants to feel rough cuticles in their booty hole like that's uncomfortable Mm -hmm. nobody wants that but if you have gloves on everything feels really slick and nice and it'll make the experience a little bit better and then if somebody's like you know what i hate this i just don't really like it at all i'm not finding anything about this i like you can stop you haven't spent 85 dollars on a toy you don't have to feel guilty that you spent this much money and that you don't like it and you're just like this is it but if you love it come back and buy like a small toy not the biggest toy because you don't buy where you want to be. You buy, you know, you have to start where you are. Butts are greedy. People are always like, I want to buy this. Give me this toy. And it's like, no, you need it's to. All about, it's all about the journey, people. Yeah. Well, they, and it's because you're. it's a muscle, right? So when we're doing yeah. yoga, you don't start out doing the most twistiest yoga pose ever. You have to work up to it. So you have to practice and stretch and get your body limber. And over time, you can do a headstand or you can do whatever kind of, I don't know, yoga poses, but you can do those things. Same thing with your butthole. 
your butt has to get used, your muscles have to get stretched and used and like they will get used to things and you can graduate to larger and larger toys as you go, if that's a goal for you. Or you can graduate to a penis because penises are step three. Like the dick is the last thing that you should be trying to put in your butt after you've already done fingers, after you've already had at least some time with the toy, like then you can move on to a dick. And even then it depends on the size of the dick because I've had conversations with people whose partners apparently have huge dicks and they're trying to go like right from fingers to dick with no toys in between no stretching and i'm like you need to do anal training you need to get like a graduated set you need to work your way up to something almost as big as your dick for your dick to feel anywhere near comfortable to them and people aren't patient and so patience is like the overarching thing with anal sex is you have to be patient if you're really interested in it for pleasure and not because it's a notch on your belt or a bucket list item like And you don't want to hurt your partner because once you hurt your partner, you're never getting in their ass again. That is like the thing. Every person I've ever spoken to who said they accidentally went in and they're like, yep. And it's never happening again because it's been, it was too painful. Right. It's there. Nobody wants to do that. So if you want, if this is the thing you'd like to try, go the route of like, let me help you get into this pleasurable space. But also it could be fun getting there. Like, imagine giving your partner a plug and saying i'd like you to wear this like at work or while you wash laundry and think about me and like getting them ready for training and then you like maybe set a date of when you might try like finally putting a dick in and that's hot (laughs) maybe that's just me but i love that i actually i bought an anal training kit for myself but i told my my person i was like i need you to tell me to use it though (laughs) Because I won't use it. Um, It'll sit in the drawer. But I'm like, but if you make me use it, I'll use it. Yeah. Yeah. And and by the way, people like adult performers, you know, when porn stars are doing anal scenes, they do that too. They come to set with various size butt plugs and they generally like work their way up to the larger size to prepare for an anal scene. So that's even people who are very experienced in anal will also like do some training as well before. Yeah. The scene so um all of that totally makes so much sense your muscles go back like the moment you stop like with anything if you stop running or you stop doing yoga your body goes back to its state where it was at and you have to start over so yeah it totally makes sense that like even porn performers have to kind of like stay up on it in order to keep it yeah keep it limber i don't like saying loose, yeah. Not yeah loose, but it keeps it limber yeah yeah and you have to, and you're, you're right when you talked about like enjoying it, you know, because it is a muscle and if you're nervous and if you're afraid, um, you will clench up, which will make it painful. So you have to be able to like relax, which, so, uh, so much of it is mental, mm-hmm. you know, but also people need part of the relaxing is orgasms. And I think folks forget that, that it's not just moving right swiftly into anal sex one of the things i tell people all the time is make sure you have an orgasm before you even start butt play because if you start in that really light airy stage where you're just like oh this is good okay then somebody's trying to like go into your butt when you're maybe usually a little apprehensive and uncomfortable it's gonna work out so much better right Yeah. And same thing. Like a lot of performers bring toys to set and they use vibrators and they use a Hitachi to give themselves orgasms, to warm themselves up, to open themselves up so they can better, you know, take that enormous penis in their buttholes. So there's like a whole, there's a whole system to it. And uh, people at home can uh, also use that system as well to engage in fun anal sex. Like you said, background stuff that people don't even know is happening. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Lola, for coming on. This was awesome. You taught us so much, and it was really fascinating. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me on. It was a lot of fun. It was a good conversation. Can you tell everybody about where they can find you online? Plug anything that you might be working on? Yeah, so folks can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Dirty Lola. 
And if you want to find some of my other work, I did a web series called Sex Probs with Francisco Ramirez, and that is on YouTube, and it's Sex Probs with a Z. And basically, we're kind of like a queer eye, but with sex ed, and we fix your sex life. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and you guys can find me online at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. If you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filtered. Also, if you want to help me get my audio podcast ratings up in the chart, you can go to rate this podcast.com slash HRU and actually rate and review my podcast there. Basically whatever device you're on, that website will lead you to the right app to leave a review and rate my podcast. And it's super helpful to get me up in the chart. So I would appreciate that so, so much. And I really appreciate you guys tuning in. And Lola, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye.